This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. From ASM Microbe 2022 in Washington, D.C., this is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 267, recorded on June 12th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Three years we have not done a live episode, so I'm really excited to be here and welcome all of you in the audience here on the exhibit floor. Joining me today here in Washington, Michelle Swanson. Hello, Michelle Swanson from the University of Michigan and a longtime co-host. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Michelle. Appreciate My pleasure. It. And also joining us here today, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. I'm from South Carolina, in case you didn't know, where unfortunately Washington is not having Chamber of Commerce weather today. And, of course, I'm Vincent Racaniello from New York, and we have a very special guest today, uh, directly descended from Charles Darwin. I know, I'm just kidding. From New York University Medical Center, Heron Darwin. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Does everyone ask you if you're related to Charles Darwin? Everybody asks me if I'm related to Charles. Um, we finally, <clears throat> I am not. Um, I had my husband get his DNA checked out, and so far, no links. Okay. But you never know. You know, we're all related at some point. But you probably think similarly. I'd l I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. And I would like to talk about your research on mycobacterium tuberculosis. But before we do that, let's hear a little bit about your training and, and how you sure. ended up at NYU. Yeah, it's a long and winding road, right? Uh, so I'm from Los Angeles originally, and uh, I went to UCLA for my undergraduate research uh, as well as uh, for my graduate research, and I joined Virginia Miller's lab. Some of you might know who she is. Uh, I did my PhD with her. She, halfway through my PhD, she um, met Bill Goldman and moved to the university at Washington University, St. Louis. So I finished my PhD there. I did a little bit more work with her before I moved on to Weill Cornell Medical Center to do my postdoc with Carl Nathan, and that's where I started working on TB. And then I got a job at NYU, and the rest is history. And I met you many years ago, right? Yeah, I interviewed at Columbia for a job that I did not get. <laughs> it's okay. I, I actually liked you very much, but they didn't listen to me. Aw. For the record. For the record. <laughs> but that was a long time ago. Still. It was a very long time ago. I hadn't published any papers yet, so I, to Columbia's credit, they actually took a look at me before, <laughs> you know, I even published anything. And I, I think things work out for a reason, and NYU has been great. So let's talk about uh, tuberculosis. Let's put it, uh, set the scene first. Uh, what's the extent of the TB problem globally? Right. So uh, I think until COVID came around, TB kills more people every year than any other infectious disease, about one to two million. There's a number of one third of the world is infected, but that number has recently been more challenged. But it doesn't really matter because the number of people who die is quite high. It doesn't happen so much in the developed world, um, so a lot of us don't think about it, but, you know, we need to care about everyone on the planet, and TB is a huge problem in Africa and Asia, and, yeah, I mean, we really have a big problem with it, and new, new treatments need to be developed, and so studying the bacteria helps us maybe understand what can we do to develop new therapies. So why is it that it's not a problem in, say, the U.S.? So it's not... I, so good medical support, right? Antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So the major treatment for TB, because there is not a great vaccine, um, none of us have likely been vaccinated with BCG. Um, if you catch it early, there's surveillance. If you're, you know, if it turns out you actually have TB, you can get on antibiotics and you can get cured. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not a huge problem here. In places like sub-Saharan -Sah Africa, HIV is a huge problem. And co-infection is what really is the problem because you have no immune system to fight the the disease. Mm -hmm. So how do you acquire it? Do you inhale it typically? Yeah, so it's uh, much like COVID. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. It is an airborne disease. You don't need very many bacteria. Most people can just kind of control it right away, but some people get a little unlucky. So it is very, it is infectious, um, but not as infectious as Omicron apparently. <laughs> so thankfully, yeah. Okay. So t is this a human specific 
pathogen? Yes. Yeah, so tuberculosis is absolutely a human-specific pathogen. It's not found naturally in other animals. You, there are animal models for the lab, which is mm -hmm. fantastic, but in the real world, you don't. We don't worry about it coming from another reservoir. So in theory, it could be eradicated because of that, right? <laughs> In theory, um, a big problem, unlike with a lot of viral infections, bacteria, you tend to not get lasting protective immunity. Mm -hmm. And I think TB is a great example of that. People are infected for decades. And, you know, why haven't you developed enough immunity to, to sterilize your body? So that's one of the big mysteries that a lot of immunologists are trying to understand uh, in the field. So my hope is we really need to find better drugs, either host-directed therapies as well as antibacterials. Um, so eradication, maybe not in my lifetime, but control, hopefully. As you know, my virus is about to be eradicated, so <laughs> yeah. in my lifetime, most likely. Which is pretty amazing, right? It's amazing that you can even do that. So what would be the solution or a solution to the countries that have a lot of TB? Well, um, I, I don't think there's an easy answer for that. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's just, you know, having the, the most effective therapy is having people who watch um, patients take their meds. So the big, the big problem with TB therapy is it takes a long time, so six months. But a lot of groups are now trying to shorten that time um, with drug combinations. And I believe there is a new uh, regimen that's about three months, which is a huge game changer because, as you know, when you're taking these antibiotics, you can't drink alcohol and, and you can't do certain things and they don't make you feel great. So I think shortening therapy will be the, the biggest game changer. And if I could interject, I think sure. you're being modest. A number of groups, <laughs> including your own, are working on innovative new therapies that target different parts yes, of the life cycle. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're trying. I just don't know if we're going to, you know, I think one of the hard things is when you do come up with an idea, how long does it take from bench to, to bedside? And that's really pretty rate limiting too. So yeah, we're, we're all working really hard to figure something out. But yeah, it's... I think shortening the therapy will be the big game changer, in my opinion. Vaccine, I'm not so convinced. So what are your thoughts about the totally drug-resistant TB that we've seen in India? Do we have to worry about it sneaking in to the United States and other developed nations? Sure. I mean, I think the, the issue with, I mean, travel generally um, is that, you know, we are a very open society. And if someone with XDR, extensively drug-resistant TB, or a CDR, completely drug-resistant TB, comes in and they're coughing, that's a bit of a problem. Um, it hasn't been a huge problem just yet, uh, and so I hope it stays that way, but it is a real possibility. So you write a, uh, an opinion column for AMBO Reports, and I read a couple of them because they're very, very entertaining. <laughs> good. It's a good word. <laughs> so in one of them, you wrote that uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis is the honey badger of pathogens. Yeah. So uh, why is it the honey badger of pathogens? Because it Paint the picture for us. Because it don't care, right? <laughs> so the honey badger, most people have probably seen this viral video of a honey badger that is, can, it's just absolutely fearless. It will fight snakes, you know, lions, everything. And um, it doesn't care. It just will kill whatever that organism is and eat it. Um, it will have a poisonous steak, snake bite. It might pass out for a few minutes, but then it gets right up and starts eating that snake. <laughs> um, and so my analogy is that um, the honey badger is the bacterium and the immune system is everything else that's being thrown at it. And the bacterium and the honey badger just doesn't care. So yeah, that's, that's, I think that's a good analogy. And I think a lot of people in the TB field really appreciate it and agreed with that analogy. And it doesn't care because it's co-evolved with the immune system. So it's I think so, yeah. Accumulated yeah. lots of defenses, right? I think so, and, that, and that's what we're trying to really figure out. But we also think that it might have some weaknesses, and we're really you know, excited about some of the projects looking at that. So I remember when I was uh, a student, we were always told that it's very difficult to work on MTB. It takes so long to grow. Is this still an issue? It is, but um, so when I was in Virginia Miller's lab, I worked on Salmonella, which grows fast. It has outstanding genetic tools. It's just really, it's got a beautiful animal model. You know, all everything you want in a good pathogen system to study in the lab. And I actually did not want to work on TB. It's, that's a whole other story that we're, we don't have time to discuss. But <laughs> I ended up working on TB, and I absolutely love it because um, it's slow. It takes two weeks to form colonies on a plate. 
But you do multiple experiments, and it gives you time also to just think about, okay, what could I tweak and just set it up again? And if you're well organized, there's no reason not to do it. It's also way less competitive than salmonella and some of the other <laughs> faster, more tractable organisms. So it, it's not so bad. I like that you have to plan and you have to do multiple experiments at the same time. Yeah, if you're disorganized, it doesn't work. And, and make sure each experiment is well designed, well controlled. That's right. You can't right. just like dash it off. That's right. That's right. So it does take a certain kind of personality to make it work, I think. But and it I, is incredibly rewarding to work on. And it's genetically very stable. It has got more tractable. You know, folks like Bill Jacobs has really made the tools um, to make us be able to study it in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking at your research, I was intrigued by a, a series of papers on what you call pupillation. <laughs> Population. Population. <laughs> you don't even pronounce it right. But it's, you, did you make up the, the word? Or was my it? student did. Uh -huh. uh, so my first graduate student, Mike Pierce, um, he discovered PUP. Uh, we were trying to understand how proteins were targeted to this protease in TB called a proteasome. So most bacteria that folks here study don't really have a proteasome, but the proteasome in TB is actually very biochemically similar to our proteasomes, except bacteria don't make ubiquitin, which targets proteins for degradation. And so our goal, I was an assistant professor, and my first student hit it out of the park and discovered the first protein-on-protein post-translational modification. Maybe, I don't even know if there is another one, actually, that's, you know, it's been 12 years since we reported that. Um, and he named it PUP for prokaryotic ubiquitin-like protein, and he said his inspiration was he looked over at his dog, <laughs> Thor the Yorkshire Terrier, and, uh, and just decided, I'm going to call it PUP. No pressure on future graduate students. No. You know, um, they no, all my graduate students have been really creative and made their own discoveries, but yeah, I, I actually remember talking to Victorita, who's sitting in the audience, when I presented, or my student presented that work at, at ASM in 2008, and we hadn't even published it yet, and Vic came up to the poster, and it was mobbed. There was so much interest. It was really, it was cool to see. And I said, I don't think I'm going to, my lab's going to be able to top this. And he goes, I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Vic. <laughs> but you broke all new ground that's been fertile for, for the yeah, field and everyone yeah. in your group. Yeah, it's been great. And, and we're doing all sorts of other cool creative things. But that was... You know, and, and to my student's credit, he read, you know, he was like, okay, you know, what could be doing this targeting? I mean, he did genetic screens as well, but reading was absolutely instrumental and finding the right collaborators like Steve Gigi, who's, you know, the best mass spec person on the planet, um, really helped us get it done. Did you know that genetic screens are like boxes of chocolate? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do, as a matter of fact. Um, so th this... Uh, Pup. 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 Is it like ubiquitin chemically? It's nothing like ubiquitin biochemically. Uh, ubiquitin is a very structured protein. Mm -hmm. um, it forms chains. You, uh, Pup is disordered for the most part. Um, the C terminus of ubiquitin and ubiquitin like proteins usually has a glycine. Pup has a glutamate or glutamine, depending on how it's translated. Um, the linkage is a little different, and the biochemistry, the enzymology is completely different. Hmm. And so those are kind of interesting drug targets, too, because they're not found in, in eukaryotes. So if you knock out PUP or the genes that are needed for ligation to proteins, is that lethal? It total, it's not lethal, but it attenuates the bacteria in, in okay. a small mouse model. So, yeah. so we could use less concentrations of drugs or maybe the drug sensitivities would go down? That's the idea. So um, I think, you know, we and others have been interested in targeting the population machinery. Um, Carl Nathan's lab has been trying to target the proteasome itself, but the challenge is it's so biochemically like ours. And it's also this chamber within a cell, within a thick, waxy, you know, on, you know um, membrane within a granuloma. And so to get a drug all the way into the proteasome is hard. And so the major hurdle with drug development is just getting the antibiotics or the drugs through the granuloma and into the bacteria. Um, and so I think that's, I'm not a drug development person. That's, that's just basically the challenge. How about, that people have. how about sneaking it in with a phage? Talk to Bill Jacobs about that. <laughs> yeah, the phage probably can't get in quite well enough. And, and there is evidence, ancient evidence, that mycobacteria um, did encounter phage because it does have CRISPR systems. 
but nobody knows where the spacer sequences are coming from. So we think, and they were acquired thousands of years ago, so it doesn't seem like they're very active anymore. Hmm. So is there, there's a ligase that, do you call it a ligase? Yeah, like pup ligase, yeah. Ubiquitin ligase. Is there one or are there multiple? There's only one. Okay. And so it's interesting that there is a proteasome because, as you know, in eukaryotes, that's for degradation, but also for presenting peptides in MHC. Right. Where this is probably not happening because there's no MHC. In <laughs> right, exactly. Right. It's, I think the mammalian, the eukaryotic proteasome is far more sophisticated mm -hmm. and complicated than the bacterial proteasome, it does seem to play a very regulatory role. So it degrades transcription factors, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we, yeah, obviously there's no MHC. We don't have subcellular organelles. You know, we have micro and nano compartments, but nothing like ER. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's simply to turn over, I shouldn't say simply, but its function is to turn over proteins. Its right? function is to turn over proteins in a regulated way. Right. And it sits at the top of two protein quality control systems. So it degrades a, reg a regulator of the GROW-EL system, and it also degrades a regulator of the DNAK system. Um, and so it's clearly really important for the physiology of the organism. So do you know how a protein gets targeted for population? That has been the $64,000 question. So mm. you can actually express the PUP ligase and PUP in E. coli and populate a bunch of stuff. There is no specificity uh, motif. And um, we are trying to understand why. Actually, my technician is doing a poster right now where uh, she could see that the depopulase seems to have um, some specificity based on a, a disordered sequence in the enzyme itself. What number poster is that, Heron? <laughs> 1240 over, <laughs> over <Quick> there. Run. <laughs> no, but it'll be up for a while, right? It'll be up for a while, yes. So please do check it and out. And this student's name is? So my technician, my research assistant, fabulous research assistant, who I hope will be going on the grad school market is Jin Hee Yu. And yeah, she's over there and do check it out if you can. She might be gone uh, a little bit earlier because we didn't realize <laughs> how long we were supposed to be here with the poster. So, um, but we'll leave it up for you if you want to go check it out. So there is a single enzyme that attaches PUP. And I have trouble with pup because dogs, it comes into my head. That's good. <laughs> I used, I said puke because I had the insect thought for some reason. Yeah, and I if you know. talk to a German, they'll tell you it means something else completely oh, different. Okay. <laughs> right. um, single enzyme to attach, and then there's a single enzyme to take it off as yeah, well? Yeah, so there's a depopulase called DOP, and that's what the poster is on. Um, okay. So, and again, we don't understand how that's regulated. Um, it, it's a huge mystery to the field. The other thing we discovered a few years ago was the ligase can actually depopulate and then move pup to another protein. Yeah. So it's sort of like a transpopulation, but in a, in a two-step pathway, um, which we think is really interesting. So, so just the mycobacteria have uh, these proteasomes or other No, bacteria? so all actinobacteria with the exception of the carini bacteria. Okay. But what's interesting is the carini bacteria have population, and it seems to be to add a handle to a protein that might help disaggregate it, which is also super interesting. Okay. I, com I completely forgot what I was going to yeah, ask. Okay, no problem. So uh, <laughs> the addition of a pup then sends it to the proteasome. How does that work? So that is a fantastic question. I have a graduate student, Shoshana Khan, working on that now. We know that pup itself can interact with this triple A, this hexameric ATPase. That's like ClipX. You know, some of you might know about that. And pup will interact with the ATPase and actually get some structure, even though it's normally unstructured. And that is sufficient to um, act as a receptor. But the big uh, sort of, you know, elephant in the room in our field is if you try to do this in vitro, it will not degrade the protein. So we think there are things that uh, help bring the ATPase to the proteasome and then activate it to open it for degradation. And so Shoshana's done a big genetic screen to look for these effectors or these, you know, assistant activators. Um, we found a few things. We don't quite understand how they work yet. Uh, and so I think with the pandemic, it's also been a challenge to just get everything going again. Um, but hopefully next year we'll have a, a better clue. You got it? Okay. I, I remember. <laughs> so once upon a time, I worked on SEC-A, ah, which yeah. asked every protein in the cell, would you like to go out? 
<laughs> so the cell tightly controls the number of sec A molecules it has. So similarly, does tuberculosis control the number of pup molecules it manufactures? And is pup a tightly controlled system so you don't have too much pup around to muck up the works? That's a really interesting question. At least transcriptionally, all the, the population machinery, the proteasome, everything is, seems to be constitutive. They're all housekeeping. And yet we know that the number of proteasomes is not saturating because we have two different activators, this ATP-dependent one and an ATP-independent one. And we know that they have to compete for a proteasome's attention. Um, and so the, there is some sort of regulation. We just don't know what it is. PUP itself um, is very unstable if it's not attached to another protein. So if you were just making PUP, it'll just get degraded by the proteasome. I think you know, you, you'll never see it. The only way you can see free PUP is if you kill the proteasome itself. So yeah, the, it, these are great questions. And you know, the field is relatively young. It's you know, less than 20 years old. And, and, it's, and because it's TB, <laughs> it's also just very hard to figure out um, how to find these things out. And there's not too many labs because you need a level three lab in order to work with it. Well, yeah. You know, that's, so that's true, at least if you want to work on TB. One of my major competitors is in Switzerland, and she doesn't work on TB, but they use Smegmatis. Uh, we choose not to use smegmonis mainly because uh, a lot of the phenotypes associated with TB are not observed in smegmonis. So people in my lab were just like, I don't want to work on smegmonis. You know, even though it grows way faster, it's BSL-1, you know, we might as well do the interesting biology in the relevant organism. Is every protein a target for population or is there selectivity? There does seem to be selectivity. We don't understand why, because the only thing that it seems to need to see is a lysine <laughs> that okay. is, you know, facing out. And so, like I said, if you, you know, expressed a gene from E. coli or from, from MTV in E. coli or just even E. coli proteins, you can get population um, for reasons we don't understand. So one of our working hypotheses is that if a protein is in a complex hmm. um, all of those proteins might be able to get populated, but maybe only one of them, for whatever reason, is recognized by the proteasome. And so we're trying to understand, well, what, what is determining that? And that those other populated proteins can act like a reservoir for PUP, because as I said, PUP is only stable when it's on a protein, and we have shown that PUP can be transferred from one protein to another. So maybe PUP plus something else is directing it to the proteasome. Now, That's what we hope. <laughs> in E. coli, if you populate proteins, is there any consequence? Of that? No, that was what was really shocking. We thought it would slow growth down, but nothing happened. You know, mm -hmm. you add IPTG, you get all this pup, all these proteins get modified, and bacteria didn't, didn't even miss a beat. But <laughs> just grew presumably, fine. if you put the proteasome in there, then that would do something. Ah, uh, so my student Shoshana has just made that strain, and so we'll see what happens. Um, okay. It seems viable, so I'll say that. But she hasn't expressed the ligase um, so we haven't, actually, we haven't made that strain quite yet, but we can do it. But it's something you'd like to do, right? Because if it works, if proteins that get degraded, then maybe just PUP is important. Well, what we're hoping, we know that if you express a populated protein uh, in E. coli with a proteasome and the ATPase, that is not sufficient to get it degraded. So the reason why she mm. built this strain is so she can now add things back and see, can we now stimulate degradation in E. coli? Okay. Now, um, do you take cues from eukaryotic ubiquitin and, and proteasome uh, systems? We do to some extent, and believe it or not, I'm probably invited to more ubiquitin proteasome meetings than I am <laughs> TB meetings, because um, I'm not a threat. <laughs> so, um, no, I think they just find it really fascinating. Uh, but they are so different, so there are certain techniques that I, because I think the ubiquitin field is very sophisticated. There is a lot of money in it especially because of cancer and things like that. And so um, I get advice, but, you know, people in that field are, have just been so welcoming and, you know, open to help us. And, and I think that's been, that's been really a joy, in, at least being part of that community. Yeah, when, I, when my lab identified the poliovirus receptor, I started getting invited to bacterial adhesion meetings. Huh. And I figured I wasn't a threat. That's why I was invited <laughs> to them. Well, and probably because it was just also very interesting. <laughs> I should You're being a little yeah. humble. <laughs> Beautiful biology. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't get invited to them anymore, so it's okay. <laughs> I found a couple of things on your website I wanted to ask you about. Oh, oh boy. 
And I, this is funny because I often do this and then people said, really, that was on my, my website? <laughs> anyway, there's one, you have all these bullet points of things you'd like to um, answer. One of them is how this pup system regulates nitrate metabolism. So does it? Yeah, so that's actually how we are. So this is getting back to the how does the proteasome interface with the ATPase and PUP, mm -hmm. right? And so this is what Shoshana's project has been. Um, so we know that in if you grow TB in nitrate, the interaction degradation gets stimulated. So what she did was a screen for mutants that didn't allow that degradation to happen specifically in nitrate. Um, and we know that the reason why we need protein degradation in nitrate is so that it can turn over a transcription factor that represses the HSP60 or the grow el system, which is needed to fold enzymes needed for nitrate metabolism. It's a little Rube Goldberg, but we got it, you know. So, so now we're trying to understand, well, what is the nitrate signal saying to bring everything together? I like that because it's an example of where turnover is important for a, for a specific system. Oh, absolutely, right? yeah. Because you mentioned earlier transcription factors, which makes sense, right? You don't need them anymore, so you get rid of them. And, and there must be a lot of other examples of that, right? Yeah. In this case, it's so, it's so specific. You want to turn over the transcription factor so that you can get this, you know, protein quality control system expressed. And that will allow the bacteria to survive in a condition right. where nitrate's the only nitrogen source. Perhaps in a low oxygen environment like a granuloma? Oh my gosh, Michelle, that's like, so we've even done that experiment. It does seem that hypoxia can also induce degradation, but we think that the mechanism might be different from the nitrate um, st stimulation, but we have looked at that too. Yeah. It's always about where do you dump your waste electrons? <laughs> yeah, actually. Carl and without would agree oxygen, with that. you got to put them someplace. Yeah. So. All right, so here's <laughs> another bullet point from. Your website. This, I think, is cool because this involves plants. Oh, yeah. Cytokinins are apparently made in MTB and they transduce signals. So tell us about that. Yeah. So cytokinins are normally known as plant hormones. They're adenine-based and they have a modification that makes them a hormone. And they're very specific. Um, and my former postdoc, Marie Samanovic, she found that this was acting as a transcriptional inducer um, so you add cytokinin to TB, you get this very specific transcriptional response, and it also makes the bacteria lose acid fast staining, which is totally fascinating. We don't know how any of it works. We've tried really hard, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. And I actually get interest all over when I go visit schools. You know, a lot of people ask me about that. We're not funded to work on that project because it doesn't seem to have any direct link to pathogenesis. It's just a really interesting question. Um, and so we're trying to figure out, you know, what does this have to do with why does TB have this thing? How is the signal transduced? Um, but one thing I do kind of want to plug on the side, and maybe you're going to bring this, maybe I'll just save it because you might bring it up. It'll come back to the cytokine. <laughs> if I don't, you yeah, definitely bring it up. So okay. the, how did you stumble onto the cytokine? Okay, so now you're leading me to what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the proteasome is needed for nitric oxide resistance to the bacteria. So nitric oxide is made by your macrophages to help control bacterial infections. Mm -hmm. And this was Carl Nathan's big uh, discovery many years ago now. And um, if you knock out proteasome function, you become very sensitive to nitric oxide. And what Marie figured out was that you get the accumulation of this protein called lonely guy. Okay, <laughs> so lonely guy is an enzyme that makes cytokinins. And it's called lonely guy because when it was discovered in plants about 20 years ago, um, the, the flowers lacked the male organ. <laughs> or, sorry, the female organ and only had the male organ. And so therefore it was a lonely guy, right? So this enzyme makes the cytokinins. And what Marie figured out was cytokinins always have to be broken down. And the breakdown products are adenine and aldehydes. And so aldehydes, we all know, are kind of toxic. They react with DNA and proteins and everything else. And so somehow the aldehydes make the bacteria very, very sensitive to nitric oxide. What we've recently discovered, my other, one of my students, Gina Limon, has discovered is that also makes bacteria very sensitive to copper. So copper is also mobilized by macrophages to help control bacteria. And we know that what we think is happening is that the aldehydes react with cysteines that normally bind to copper to either inactivate it or to sense it and then turn on genes to respond to copper. So, we, so this whole thing with aldehydes has been very fascinating, and this all comes for the, from the cytokinin work. And so what I'll tell you now, which I think is really cool, is we think that aldehydes 
are not only can they accumulate in the bacteria, but we think that we, during our infections, induce the production of aldehydes to help control them. And so Michelle might know about this because there's been some nice work in Legionella where when you infect macrophages, they induce aerobic glycolysis, right? And so, and this is interferon gamma dependent. Well, TB does this too. And aerobic glycolysis, you know, we all know about this from biochemistry. Um, it makes, you know, it makes ATP, but it also makes a lot of other products. And several of them are aldehydes. And what Sarah Stanley at UC Berkeley and I have now shown is that those aldehydes can, uh, the, the metabolic aldehydes can make bacteria very sensitive to nitric oxide as well as copper. And so we're now thinking that maybe one of our defenses is the production of aldehydes. And this is a really compelling piece of data that I think people here or, and people listening might be um, fascinated by, is that evolutionarily there is a mutation found in Asians that prevents them from drinking alcohol effectively, right? You get this glow. And, you know, I always go to it, I'll say, how many people in this room can't drink alcohol because they get all red and flushed? And inevitably, you know, several people of Asian descent raise their hand. And it's because they have a mutation in aldehyde dehydrogenase 2, or ALDH2. And that mutation converts, uh, that enzyme normally converts acetylaldehyde produced from ethanol into acetate. But it's, all, it's not there for alcohol metabolism. That's just an incidental thing. That, mutate, that gene is there to metabolize aldehydes that we're constantly producing from inflammation and things like glycolysis potentially. Um, and I think those folks, so those folks who have that mutation, there is published data showing that if you have the mutation, you're less likely to have tuberculosis, right? Isn't that nuts? Making more aldehydes. Right? Making more aldehydes. So maybe yeah. those yeah. people were selected for in, in China. By... By TB. Yeah, by TB, yeah. right? So we're testing that, and we have some really compelling mouse data to support that. And uh, we also have another cohort in Vietnam that we've been looking at, and it's a similar correlation is there. It's not 100%, but it's, it's definitely significant. How would you, sh I don't know if you're interested in doing this, but how would you show that TB actually selected for this, uh, this mutation in a certain population? I think we, I think the, um, so at least the published data that say, okay, we looked at a bunch of different disease states and the people with TB and this mutation, you're less likely to have TB if you have the mutation, is pretty compelling. However, we don't know what other infectious diseases may have been out there yeah, when that right. mutation arose. Having said that, uh, so we have a, this cohort of Vietnamese TB patients that are, is being studied by Sarah Dunstan in Melbourne, Australia. Um, when they analyzed the data, they said, yes, we also see the similar um, association that if you have the mutation, you're less likely to have TB. However, if you do have TB and you have the mutation, you're more likely to have what's known as a Beijing strain of TB. And these are known as hypervirulent TB strains. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of this, it's kind of like Harmeet Malik's, you know, Red Queen, except this is the slowest Red Queen ever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a mutation that arises and then the TB evolves to maybe induce less aldehyde production or just become more infectious somehow. Um, and so, so we are looking, I mean, this is all just at the you know, early stages. And what's cool is there is a drug that inhibits that enzyme in humans called antabuse, right? So it, it treats alcoholism, because if you inhibit the enzyme, then you're not gonna wanna really drink, or you can't drink effectively. Mm -hmm. um, so it's you know, cheap, it's off patent. Could we use it to treat TB? That's something we're also looking into. So would it make the patient with TB more sensitive to the antibiotic cocktail you're giving them? I think it would actually help. So we worked with Brie Aldridge, who's at Tufts, um, and she has this really cool thing called Diamond to look at the integration of different, like the interaction of different antibiotics um, with each other. And we asked her to test antabuse with a bunch of TB drugs. It doesn't interfere. There might even be some synergy. Do you know if any of the sequence genomes of ancient humans have this mutation, this an aldehyde dehydrogenase gene? Yeah, so the mutation is a very specific point mutation. It's a specific amino acid substitution. Um, it makes a protein, and the enzyme is a tetramer. So even if you're heterozygous, the enzyme is not functional, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and so, yeah, you can trace back, you know, an estimated four to 6,000 years ago is when that mutation arose. And these more virulent TB strains seems to have come after that, which also kind of supports that maybe that's driving yeah. that evolution. Yeah. How long has TB been infecting humans? Oh, 
thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. That's the. I mean, they find at it least mummies. twelve. At least twelve thousand. <laughs> at least twelve thousand. Yeah, years. yeah. That it's it's an old old disease. And where did it? come from do we know i don't know <laughs> <laughs> maybe from the environment you know like mycobacterium smegmonis has a bigger genome you know so maybe it's somehow co-evolved right i don't know so heron at the start you told us that you um your thesis work was on uh salmonella and mm. then you made the bold switch to tb if you reflect back now on all of the discoveries and the new places it's taken your lab like studying this new biochemical modification mm. and aldehydes as part of the innate immune system Reflecting on that, do you have any advice for um, our listeners or people who might yeah, be? Yeah, um, I was never that, like, bright of a student, <laughs> in my opinion. I really like following. So I think, you know, study, find something interesting to study, have an interesting question, and don't be afraid to go to the next level. I mean, I never, ever, ever thought I would do biochemistry. And actually, I, I've really grown to love it because I learn how does this molecule do this to another molecule? I think that's super, super interesting. Um, and, you know, don't be shy about collaborating. And I think if you just follow your nose and also get people in your lab who um, are just genuinely curious. I mean, I, I've been incredibly lucky. The people in my lab have been incredibly motivated and driven and creative and smart. And um, all I do is just tell me what you need, right? What can I buy for you? Who do you need to talk to? What technique do you need? And, and that's, I think that's what trainees should try to expect from their advisors um, if they're seeking something out. I have one more question for you, yeah. but before that, uh, we'll take some questions from the audience. So if you want to ask one, Ray has a mic and you can raise your hand. He'll give it to you. But my last question for you, another of your opinion pieces, you talk about bandwagoning. What's that? Yeah, so just to give a little background on, on the EMBO reports pieces, um, the editors there, uh, Holger, um, uh, Holger Breitraub, I can't quite pronounce his last, they're German. Anyway, he, Holger contacted me and said, would you be interested in writing these opinion pieces? And I'm like, I don't know why you're asking me. I don't know if I have anything to really say. You've, you've always had opinions here. <laughs> yeah, maybe they know that, even over there. And so, and so, so, um, so the first one I wrote, it was bandwagoning, was inspired by this sort of money grab um, when COVID hit. And people at my institution and others, people who've never worked on infectious disease, let alone on a virus, suddenly are writing these grants to study COVID. And it was, it was just infuriating to me. And I also, so my, my plea in that opinion piece was, you're all doing something important. Even if you're working on Saccharomyces or E. coli, you're answering fundamental questions and your discovery might be important for something else and let the virologists, <laughs> let the experts handle the COVID problem. Um, and, you know, I think with just kind of as a tangent on fundamental biology, you know, people like Catalin Carrico didn't, you know, passionately stick with her mRNA vaccines, you know, where would we be now? Not here, <laughs> I'm mm, sure, nope. right? So um, I just feel that people don't get too weighed by the money that's out there and just stick with your question of interest. And, and so I think that was just my like frustration um, mm -hmm. coming out in that piece. Yeah. If I could follow up, one of the other perspective pieces you published recently or published is PsyCon about coming to conferences. And I found it interesting because it was both about your personal journey, but also like a pro tip sheet. Yeah. How you make the most of the poster of the talk of, of meeting people. Right. Yeah, so SciCon, because, you know, conference season was upon us and um, I organized a meeting that's next month, uh, I just thought it was a good time to kind of explain, like, what I was thinking and what I hope people who come to meetings like this will get to anticipate. Um, and I do think, you know, there's a lot to learn on how to present a good poster or a good short talk or a good long talk, you know, anyway. And what about networking? Do you have oh, advice? Oh, yeah. Networking is great. People shouldn't be shy to approach you, you know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I... I Obviously, if you're introverted, which I kind of point out in the in the piece, it might be a little bit harder. But, you know, I, I think it's really a powerful. I wouldn't know these guys, you know, if I hadn't kind of gotten out there to, to chit chat with people. So back to the uh, bandwagoning that that hit home with me because this is not the first time that that's happened. Right. After 9-11, we had similar things, HIV AIDS. And it's I think a reflection of how hard it is to get funded. Yeah, and I wish, yeah, I mean, all this money was dumped into to COVID, for example, but why couldn't it have been used for yeah, other things? Sure. Yeah, so, yeah, I remember after 9-11, these regional centers of excellence were opening up, building new buildings, and 
I, I at the time I was a gra- you know a graduate student. And I'm like, this is a monumental waste of money, and who's going to pay for the upkeep? Right. And that's been a problem. Right. I think some of them have managed to stay okay, and the newer, the more recent, um, you know, calls to for research grants. It's not about building buildings, but more about supporting the research. But I'll, I'll play devil's advocate. I think there still is room for people to switch fields when they have expertise in a particular discipline that actually could accelerate that other field. Sure. So, yeah, but, yeah, there's good, yeah, absolutely. Any questions from anyone? Mr. Dr. Mark Martin, yes, you bring him a microphone. You know, you're going to get a, a plushie as a consequence. Oh. After he asks. You don't he need got, one? He already got one. He's got one. He, he, he <laughs> shamelessly already All has right. it right here. Well, I'll throw it out for someone you else to get. No, no, yeah. Hey there. Hi, Dr. Darwin, I'm a big fan. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, from afar, I'm Mark Martin, the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. I love coming up with things to tell my undergraduate students about this relationship between evolution and resistance. They're used to things like sickle cell anemia. There's some business uh, that I've heard having to do with Tay-Sachs and CFTRs. But this is the first I've heard about this relationship to TB. Um, and I'm going to write to you for a reference to see if you can send me something about that so that I can start talking about that with students and get them thinking about it. So I, I'm happy to just, you don't even have to write to me, but you're welcome to. Um, Sarah Stanley and I published in current, uh, no, in open biology, uh, something called the aldehyde hypothesis. And it just came out. So and it talks about all of our um, rationale and thinking. Yes, so it's out there. You're welcome. Is someone back there? Just fell on the floor. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants measles. How about uh, on this side? Anyone? At, first of, any other know? questions? Any other questions? Hi, uh, yes. Ray's got a question. There you go. Slow um, down. I'm very excited. Just don't knock the equipment Hi. Yeah, so I'm an I'm a current undergraduate student. Um, yeah, I know I'm I'm uh, <laughs> somewhat rare in these parts. But uh, do you have any words on like? Uh, just, I honestly don't know how to word this, but like uh, any words of advice for like anybody who's like aspiring to go into research and stuff? So what's my suggestion? Yeah. What My advice would be find a topic you're really interested in. Um, and just, if you're an undergraduate now and hopefully you're at a place where there is some research that you just approach the PI, right? The principal investigator and ask them, talk to them, make appointments and see if um, if they're willing to take you on and... Yeah, and then just read. I think those are those are the things I would advise you to do. And then ask to talk to other people in that lab and ask about their experience. Definitely. And so I hit no one in the head. Just come up and get Hi. your flu virus. Yeah. Hi, uh, Winston, Please. Michael, and Michelle. I'm a big fan of Twim. I have been followed Thank for you. 10 years probably. Wow. Cool. Uh, I'm so excited to see you guys in person. <laughs> so your voice is so sexy, and I... I I always listen to, not, not Vincent, but Michelle and Michael. So I always listen to him when I was drive, when, when I was cooking. So everywhere I can hear your voice. So I'm so excited to get here. But I, I still I'm a, have a, some scientific problem. <laughs> seems um, I'm working on some plant macro interaction. It seems no one interests in plants. So my question is that how can you get everyone interested in your research and get funded? I mean, if I can comment on plants. I don't think that's true. There's a lot of people very interested in plants. Um, Michigan State, right? That's an amazing, you know, plant biology place, you know, leader in the world. Um, I think when you're in a certain community, you forget that there's so many other things out there because you're just completely limited to your world. So, I, you know... I, I would disagree that people are not interested in plants. Um, and in terms of, you know, I think what you have to do is connect why we should care about plants and explain your science in a very clear and simple way. Um, I think it, everyone should know that plants are ridiculously important and they're also just, you know, beautiful organisms to study. They're very complicated. And, and we need to feed the world. Yeah, they need to feed the world. And a lot of us are more plant-based than we used to be, so... <laughs> and one of the most important things to appreciate that I learned at this meeting is California has recently passed a law about the amount of fertilizer you can add to soil. 
And so microbes are actually nitrogen fixers that are natural fertilizer makers. And so understanding the microbial plant interaction, especially the symbiotic relationships, is very important. But more importantly, can you use microbes to make fertilizer to effectively circumvent, you know, the, the California law that says thou shall not put so much fertilizer onto the soil because they're worried about runoff. The other tip I would offer is to um, find a couple of conferences in your field and really just build some relationships, ask for advice, and, um, and present your research. Vincent, I think she should start a podcast. <laughs> Don't you? Yeah, definitely a good idea. We'll talk about it. Yes? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Henrik. Uh, I'm actually a software engineer, so um, bio is a new field for me. But uh, I'm actually curious from a um, data modeling point of view in TB research, how far is that field today? How much is machine learning modeling applied? And what are the challenges that you face uh, today? Thank you. I mean, I'm not very good with computers, but there are folks who are doing... Uh, that type of work, uh, modeling things like granuloma and how the granuloma um, develops. I'm like blanking. Denise Denise Kirshner at Denise University Kirshner, of Michigan. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I'm blanking. It's Denise Kirshner. She does really cool modeling of the granuloma with TB, and she works with biologists to tweak that. Um, I can't really comment in the broader scheme of things. I think it's fascinating. I don't quite understand how it works, <laughs> but it is an area of interest. All right, that's about time for to wrap up uh, this episode of TWIM. As usual, you can find the show notes, asm.org slash TWIM, questions or comments, twim at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy our work, we depend on your support. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today from NYU Medical Center, Heron Darwin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank this was great. Thank you. Really appreciate Thank it. you. From the University of Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Wonderful to be together. Yeah, it is. Hopefully again next year, right? And from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Thank you everyone. And I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM, for allowing us to do an episode here, and to Ray Ortega for uh, being our producer. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.